And how many times in the emergency room do you ask when a patient comes in for abdominal pain, new abdominal pain, when was your last bowel movement? That question isn't necessarily the direct question. Um, it tends to be more often about, do you have problems with constipation or diarrhea? And we'll talk a little bit about some of the criteria that we look for for this. Um, but that should be part of any conversation. Most diagnoses are made first by history and second by physical exam and third by tests. Perfect. So I think we've definitely laid out the case that this is an important issue. I'd add one thing though, David. One thing to think about too though, as prescribers, especially in outpatient settings, when we're thinking about prescribing an opioid, that's also not the first side effect we're gonna think about. I gotta think if the patient's gonna be safe taking the opioid, I've gotta think about um, the family that might be, uh, have access to it. I've gotta think about all of those things. And so constipation oftentimes is low on the list and therefore you know, results in that might be a second or a third visit before we ever get to the constipation question. Mm -hmm. Certainly a less visible symptom or adverse effect of a well-intended medication class. Um, Steve, you alluded to kind of how to diagnose and then starting into how to treat opioid-induced constipation. Jeff, I might ask you, could you tell us about how you actually make this diagnosis? What are the things we should keep in mind? Um, so that, that's a great question, and, and I'm gonna actually call upon my, my pharmacy colleagues out there uh, to, to try and be more uh, astute with, with the questions that they would ask these, these patients because a lot of times, the patients end up in a pharmacy first. So there is something called the Rome 4 criteria, and that looks like at a number of domains. So for example, if the patient has had fewer than three spontaneous bowel movements a week, uh, that's important. Uh, if they're straining, actually there's, there's a, then there's a bunch of criteria that if the patient 25% or more of the time. So that would be straining, lumpy stools, um, uh, a sensation of, of blockage, um, or incomplete e uh, evacuation, or if the patient fails, they have to do a manual manipulation. If any of those happen 25% or more of the time, that would meet the, uh, the Rome 4 criteria. Uh, and, and simple questions to ask. Yeah, I think there's two components, as you allude to there, Jeff. There's what I think of as the quantitative and then the qualitative part, right? So it's, it's been a topic, particularly as these drugs uh, were being studied, as to how best look at their efficacy, and particularly, obviously, against placebo. So FDA, as you know, sort of came down on the quantitative side as they're wanting that to be a primary endpoint, being the number of spontaneous bowel movements, as you referenced. But I think a lot of us as clinicians think the qualitative components are equally, if not sometimes more important, that issue of straining, as you alluded to, or, or just difficulty having a bowel movement or hard lumpy stools or incomplete evacuation. So I think for clinicians, we need to be uh, astute to both of those uh, sort of categories, if you will, and not just focus on one or the other. And I really have to stress, in the emergency department, opiate-induced constipation is not necessarily a diagnosis of exclusion, but there are a number of steps you have to go through first before you latch on to that diagnosis. I mean, the most common uh, presentation is not constipation, it's abdominal pain uh, or, or rectal pain. And then really it starts with your history. Part of that might be the prescription drug monitoring uh, program, which would give you an idea this person might be at risk I really need to stress that a PDMP is a conversation starter, not a conversation stopper. It's not, we're done talking here, no. It's let's go down this road and explore what we can do to help. But this might, ex uh, the next thing is physical exam. And I can't stress enough that a lot of the information I get is made within three inches of a physical exam. Um, it involves a rectal exam on patients, which is important. Um, and finally, I would say that the workup might entail laboratory exams, it might entail CAT scans, et cetera, um, before you get to that final diagnosis. You may have an inkling that this is where you're headed, but I wouldn't latch onto it just because it's abdominal pain, I haven't had a bowel movement for a couple of days, and I'm on an opiate. And certainly I know in, in my palliative practice, I see a lot of patients with malignancy, with just terrible pain who are on uh, chronic opioids. Um, Teresa, I imagine this is a population that you see as well. Can you talk about the NCCN guidelines? For Absolutely. Absolutely. So this is a patient population that I see quite frequently, um, both in the outpatient as well as in the hospital setting. So the National Comprehensive Cancer Network, or um, NCCN, uh, 
established a set of guidelines to help clinicians direct treatment when it comes to constipation, specifically opiate-induced constipation. So it starts, like many other guidelines, with looking at behavioral management strategies, um, diet, exercise, stress reduction, as the first and foremost and kind of the groundwork in terms of managing constipation, uh, opiate-related and not. Uh, and then it goes into looking at over-the-counter uh, laxatives. So recommendations for stool softeners and over-the-counter laxatives is uh, first line in terms of the pharmacotherapies. And then uh, looking at second line, more of the osmotic or the saline type laxatives. And then quickly going on to the Pomoras as a, uh, a treatment option when the above fail.